By the time Jesus came to Galilee preaching and healing, it had been almost 700 years. Jeremiah had promised it would only be 70 years. 70 years away from the land, 70 years without the temple, 70 years to contemplate their sins, 70 years to find their God again. And they had gotten back to the land in a sense. The temple had been rebuilt. There were sacrifices being made. There were holidays being separated, celebrated, I should say. But it wasn't what they expected. That return from the exile, that coming back to the land, it wasn't exactly the glorious thing that Isaiah had suggested to them that it might be. The desert hadn't exactly flowered. When they rebuilt the temple, the old men who remembered the first one wept. It seemed to a lot of people in Israel that an exile that had been promised of only 70 years had somehow been extended to almost 700 years. Some people wondered if it would ever end. There were other people who continued to look for that stump from the shoot of Jesse that Isaiah talked about. That one who would come and regather the nation and crush the Gentiles with a rod of iron. When this happened, Isaiah told them, the wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the lion and the fat men together. And the little child shall lead them. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When that time came, when that restoration occurred, when that kingdom came, all those old hostilities that had divided people would be over. The hostilities that had even divided the animal kingdom would be over. When that shoot of Jesse came. And this is what they longed for during those long, dreary years. Now hundreds of years of exile. This is what they longed for. This is what they wanted more than anything else. And it still, after 700 years, could stir their hearts. And after 2,000 years, it can still stir our hearts, can it? This vision of Isaiah, this vision of reconciliation and wholeness, their hope, their longing, a reunified people under an ideal king in a peaceful land. And this is what I think they heard in Israel when Jesus came preaching, the kingdom of God is at hand. This is what I, thought, I think they thought about. This kingdom of Isaiah, this peaceful kingdom that he predicted, this kingdom of joy and peace and wholeness. Much of the hope they got from the book of Isaiah. And I, I suggested to my students when I taught in this area that I think Isaiah was Jesus' ministry man. I think when Jesus thought about his ministry in Old Testament terms, he thought about it principally from the book of Isaiah, although certainly there were many other passages as well. Both in Jesus' words and in the words of the, of the gospel writers, the, the words of Isaiah are used over and over again to set the context and purpose of Jesus' ministry. His eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners, for example, anticipates that great messianic banquet of Isaiah chapter 25, which is called a feast for all people when death itself will be destroyed. On this mountain, Isaiah said, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich foods. A feast of well-aged wines. Then the Lord will wipe away every tear from their faces. Jesus' healing ministry has at its background Isaiah 35. That passage that talks about them coming back from the exile through the flowering wilderness in which it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. Jesus' first sermon was drawn from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release from the captives and recovery of sight for the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Perhaps most especially, His suffering and redeeming death is understood in Isaiah's terms. Of the suffering and redeeming death of the uh, of the servant in chapter 52 and 53 of Isaiah. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a punishment that made us whole. Jesus, I think, framed his ministry in terms of Isaiah. 
As I said, there's more of the Old Testament that was important to Jesus. And there, and there is a sense in which Jesus' ministry is founded on the whole flow of the Old Testament. One student of the Old Testament has said the story of the Old Testament is the story of the death and resurrection of Israel. When Israel goes into exile, there's a sense in which it dies. And when it returns from the exile, there's a sense in which it is raised again. It comes back to life. <laughs> and this is seen in a number of passages, but most especially in that wonderful passage in Ezekiel 37, the Valley of the Dry Bones, where the, the prophet is taken to this valley, and he's asked about these bones. And God says to him, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. That is, we're dead as a doornail. There's no hope for us. And God says, not so. These dead, dry bones of Israel and live. And so in this vision, you have the clacking of these bones together and the spirit breath of God that flow into these dead bodies and they stand up resurrected, a mighty army. And there are people who will say, well, where is the description of the death and resurrection of Messiah in the Old Testament? I think it's symbolized in the death and resurrection of Israel. And Jesus is a symbolic Israelite. Jesus is the man who represents in his person as Messiah the whole of the house of Israel. And when he dies, Israel dies. And when he is raised to life, Israel is raised to life. But then more than Israel is raised to life. Jesus life and ministry reenacts and anticipates the death of the exile and reenacts and anticipates the resurrection of the restoration. When Jesus comes, he says, the exile is just about over. The banquet is almost here. The kingdom is just around the corner. The thing that you've been longing for for 600 years, for 2,000 years, is just about here. The kingdom has already arrived, the blind, the lame, and the speechless. And in his death, Israel dies. And in his resurrection, Israel is reborn. But for Jesus, that rebirth was more than just for Israel. That resurrection was more than just for that one people. It was for all of his creation, Jew and Gentile alike. When Jesus died and was raised, everyone would die and be raised with him. As Paul put it, for since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. Now the fact that this kingdom was going to be extended to everybody, is going to be extended beyond Israel, that would prove somewhat controversial. As a matter of fact, more than anything else, I think the notion that somehow these blessings that had been thought to be Israel's exclusive claim were going to be extended to the Gentiles, that as much as anything else got Jesus killed. Where did he get this idea? I think he got it from Isaiah. Because for Isaiah, the kingdom of God was more than just a victory for Israel. For Isaiah, the kingdom of God was more than just a vindication of Israel. For Isaiah, the kingdom meant that the old divisions, the old borders and boundaries, the things that separated people from one another, these things were going to be removed. I think that for Isaiah, with the arrival of the kingdom, with the arrival of what God was predicting for all of his people, those old Levitical codes that divided people and persons and time, people and objects and things and time, these divisions were going to be removed and eliminated. There was priestly restrictions that defined what was clean and unclean. Those things, I think, Isaiah thought, were going to be gone. In Isaiah 56, God speaks through the prophets, and he tells the Gentiles and eunuchs that both of them were now in this new thing that God was doing in bringing the people back from the exile. Both of them were going to have access to God. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, Eunuchs and other damaged people had no access to God. They couldn't approach the sanctuary. And some of the Gentiles couldn't approach the sanctuary for generations, and others not at all. But Isaiah says, when the kingdom come, when the exile is over, all that's over too. And there's even more to it than that in Isaiah. There's another significant barrier that's going to collapse 
fall when the kingdom arrives. And that's the barrier between priest and people. Amen. You shall all be called priests of the Lord. You shall all be named ministers of our God. Now this isn't new. This was part of God's original intent. In Exodus 19, he tells Israel, you shall be for me a priestly people and a holy nation. I want to suggest to you that I think Jesus came in his ministry developing these notions of Isaiah about the breaking and the shattering of the barriers and the falling of these barriers between people in his teaching and healing ministry. Now for Christians, of course, removal of these barriers is one of the new things that God is doing through the church. Peter writes to the church in Asia Minor, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And in the book of Revelation, we are told over and over again that God has made us a kingdom of priests. And at the end of the book, we are told that all of those who are raised to new life will be priests of God and of Christ. In the kingdom of God, all God's people are priests. Amen. But there's more. Not only in Isaiah and prophets would all God's people be priests with access to God, with the right to lead the praises of God, but in the kingdom, all of God's people are going to possess the Spirit. No longer is the Spirit going to be limited to kings and prophets and priests and other significant figures. No longer is it going to be portioned out in a sort of careful fashion. No, there's going to be a rather profligate sharing of the Spirit. In Joel it says, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall, see dream, uh, shall dream dreams. And your young men shall shall see visions, even on the male and female slaves in those days. The male and female slaves in those days will I pour out my spirit. Peter in Acts 2 argues that this was a fulfillment. This was fulfilled at Pentecost when the spirit fell on the men and women of the infant church. But it wasn't just Joel. You find the same thing in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Jeremiah talks about the new heart and Ezekiel had promised that the Spirit would be something that would be given to all people. Uh, according to Ezekiel, God declared, A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will put my spirit within you. In the kingdom of God, neither the charismatic nor the priestly functions are limited to one class of people. All God's people have the Spirit. All God's people are priests. Jesus' ministry then begins with his background. In the kingdom that he's proclaiming, all would be holy. All would have access to God. The Gentiles, the unclean, the damaged, the least, the lost, and the losers. Jesus came to claim an Isaiah kind of kingdom. But he was immediately attacked. And why? Because Jesus and his opponents had different notions about holiness. For the Pharisees and other Jews, holiness was about separation. But for Jesus... Holiness was about access. For the Pharisees and other Jews, holiness was fragile. But for Jesus, holiness was powerful. And Jesus set about trying to unify what they wanted to keep separate. As we've seen, the destruction of the temple in 587 had been a terrible shock to the Jews. The subsequent exile of the nation in the long, long years foreign domination, put their whole nation, their whole history, their whole people at risk. For many years they had to find a way to defend themselves, and since Gentiles had shown themselves to be dangerous, the only way to preserve themselves was the way of separation, the way of building the barriers higher and higher. Keeping away from Gentiles, keeping away from those forces that were unclean. And so when Nehemiah comes as governor, he tells the men and to put away their foreign wives and children. But it's difficult, isn't it, when you're under the thumb of a foreign dominant? How is it that you stay away from them when there they are in the law courts, there they are in the, in the city streets, there they are in the businesses, when they have control of things? It got even more difficult 
In the second century BC, there was a Greek king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes who decided that he wanted to integrate the Jews into his kingdom, not only politically, but socially and religiously as well. He forbade them from keeping their law. He told them not to circumcise their children. He appointed his own toady as, as the priest, high priest in the temple, and offered a pig to Zeus on the holy altar of God. This produced the Maccabean revolt and gave the Jews some hundred years of freedom before the Romans came in. By the time of Jesus, the Romans are in control again. And once more, they're seeking freedom once more looking for a way to bring the kingdom in. And it's an understandable religious response that when you're under threat, you put barriers around yourself. When you're under threat, you, kind of, you try to hold someone off. And so some in Israel became convinced that if you could just stay holy, if you could just keep clean, if you could just preserve your purity, then perhaps the Messiah would come and deal with the Romans. And so here comes Jesus. And he comes into the midst of people that think that holiness is about separation and not access. And he comes to people that think that, that holiness is fragile and not powerful. It's kind of like soft fruit. It's easily bruised. And he comes to these people and he starts dealing with the rather questionable types. Tax collectors and sinners and Gentiles. And he's like the bull in this ecclesiastical china shop that they've set up. Sometime after the time of Jesus, we have uh, a description of a holiness map that was established in Israel. And this map mapped out relative holiness, going from the least holy to the most holy. Uh, and it started out with, with uh, places, and it said uh, the land of Israel was holier than Gentile lands. And in the land of Israel, the, the walled cities were holier uh, than the land itself. And Jerusalem was holier than the other walled cities. And in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount was holier than the rest of Jerusalem. And on the Temple Mount, the various courtyards were holier than the Temple Mount itself. So, so the court of the Gentiles was holier, and then, and then more holy than that was the court of women, and more holy than that was the court of Israel. And finally, you got to the, the very temple itself, to the sanctuary itself, or the holy place was holier than everything else, and the most holy place was the holiest of all. So you had this map from least holy to most holy, and they had the same thing with people. The least holy in the, in the uh, holiness heap were the eunuchs, followed by illegitimate children, temple slaves, freed slaves, Gentile converts, Israelite women, Israelite men, Levites, priests. Now it's clear that you want to keep the least holy people from the most holy places. So eunuchs couldn't enter the temple at all. Gentiles could only go as far as the court of the Gentiles. Israelite women could only go as far as the court of women. Israelite men could only go as far as the court of men. The court of Israel is called. The priests could only go into the sanctuary. And the high priest could only go into the holy place once a year. Because, you see, you had to keep the least holy people away from the most holy places. And Jesus comes and he says, no. Holiness is not fragile. It doesn't have to be protected. It's powerful. Holiness is not about keeping people out of stuff. It's about bringing people into stuff. He said, holiness wasn't for the select few that kept their skirts clean. But for anyone, and most especially those whose compromises are profound and obvious, most especially those who are sinners, most especially those who are the least, the lost, and the losers. In other words, all God's people are holy. Not just the priests, not just the Pharisees, and God help us, not just the men. <laughs> Jesus broke all the rules. The rules of holiness. He ate the wrong things at the wrong time and touched the wrong people. He healed a demon-possessed man on the Sabbath. He touched a, le a leper. He had dinner with the, the, the lowest of the low, tax collectors and prostitutes. According to Mark chapter 7, he declared all foods clean. In a, in a way, undercutting the whole system of taboo that had given shape to Israel. 
He tossed the, the, the money changers out of the court of the Gentiles because that limited what little access the Gentiles had to the God of Israel. Jesus threatened the whole settled system of the religious powers that be in his declaration that with his arrival and the arrival of the kingdom of God, all bets were off. Something new was set loose in the world because holiness wasn't about separation. It was about access. It wasn't fragile, but it was power. Mark chapter 5 is a key passage. My favorite passage in the New Testament. Here you have Jesus dealing with extreme cases to show how this, these uh, old barriers are down. I think the gospel writer is playing a game with can you top this? <laughs> Mark chapter 5, he starts out with all of these really bad holiness cases. The first one is a real loser, a four time holiness loser. This guy's a Gentile. Okay. okay, that's bad enough. He's racially unclean. Uh, he's possessed by a demon, and not just one, a whole army of them. Where is he living? In a cemetery, a bunch of dead bodies. And he's surrounded by pigs. <laughs> now, if there are a guy that was ever unclean, unholy, who was this guy? And it says nobody can control him. He sits in this cemetery cutting himself with stones, and Jesus comes in, heals him with the word, and sends him back to tell people what God had done for him. Because Jesus' holiness was not threatened by the multiple impurities of this man. None of these impurities matter to Jesus. Now, the second story is a story of a woman and a little girl. Now, what's interesting is when Jesus, when, when the gospel writer wants us to talk about the overcoming of uncleanness, the overcoming of these barriers, he starts out with, with Gentiles and women. And he starts out in the most unclean situations that you can, that you can ever imagine. Second story, you have a synagogue official who, who says that his daughter is dying and wants Jesus to come and heal it. And uh, Jesus begins on the way, and in the process, a woman comes up to him in the crowd, touches him, and is healed. Now, this woman has been bleeding for 12 years. Now, what's the big deal about this? Obviously, it's an illness, but according to Leviticus, this woman was perpetually unclean. Any room she entered was unclean. Any chair she sat on was unclean. Any person she touched was unclean. And this meant that she was effectively cut off from the social, religious, and familial life of Israel. As a matter of fact, this woman walking into this crowd took a considerable risk for the people discovered that someone in her condition, someone this unclean, had been brushing up against them and making them ritually impure. They may have stoned her. In her own way, she was ever bit as isolated and cut off as a leper. But when she touches Jesus, he is not defiled. She is healed. Because you see that holiness is not fragile. It's powerful. Holiness is not about separation. It's about access. The last case is a young girl, 12 years old. Did you ever notice that the woman had her problem with bleeding for 12 years? He goes to this girl and he finds that she has died. Now so far, as the rabbis were concerned, a dead body was the source of all uncleanness. Not only is it a source of uncleanness, uh, most doctors have a rather difficult time with someone who's died. You can't deal with them. It's the ultimate in illness, if you will. But Jesus is no more afraid of this dead body than he was afraid of this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years or the guy who was in the, in the cemetery cutting himself with stones. He touches her raises her to life, and turns her to a parent. Because holiness is not fragile, but power. Here in chapter 5, you have all of the least, the lost, and the losers show that through the healing power of God, all the old barriers are removed. And all the old uncleannesses that kept them from having access to God are dealt with. Mark 15, 38. At the death of Jesus, what happens in that temple? What happens to that place of relative holiness? 
The veil of the temple is torn in two. Why? Because access to God is now for everyone. Anyone and everyone can go into the Holy of Holies. Anyone and everyone can go before God. Because holiness is about access, not about separation. No longer is access to God limited. That old system that put fences around holiness and tried to protect it is destroyed by God, by the death and resurrection of Jesus. In a few weeks, the Holy Spirit is going to fall on everyone gathered in that upper room, fulfilling the promises of God, because all God's people are priests, all God's people have the Spirit, and all God's people are holy. Now Jesus came to declare that access to God was possible for everyone. And with his death and resurrection, the kingdom, in one sense, not in its completeness, had arrived. How? It had arrived in the establishing of that community that he formed to live out his teachings, the church. Now the kingdom in its fullness is not here yet, we know that. But who are we supposed to be as the church, as the people of God? We are supposed to be the community that lives by kingdom realities. We are supposed to be the, king, the community where kingdom air is breathed. We are supposed to be the place where kingdom life is experienced, kingdom values are demonstrated. The, the church, the following, the community of Jesus Christ that is called the church is the place where all God's people are priests, all God's people have the Spirit, and all God's people are holy. We are the advanced guard of the kingdom. We are the place where people are supposed to experience the realities of the kingdom of God. Now the rest of the New Testament and the rest of the last 2,000 years of church history have shown the difficulty of struggling with this set of possibilities. Paul goes to Galatia and he preaches the freedom of the gospel. And he writes this letter to the Galatians because the Galatians have been set free. All these barriers have been removed. And now they want to go back to the law. They want to return to the old barriers and, and structures that they've gotten away from in the first place. And Paul says, well, wait a minute. Once you are a grown-up adult, once you have come into your inheritance, once your, your parents or your, or your supervisor or whoever has recognized your maturity and, and said to you, yes, you're grown up, you're an adult, why would you want to go back and be a child again? Because in effect, he says to these Galatians, that's what you're doing. When you want to run back to the rules and regulations and barriers and boundaries of the law, you're like an adult wanting to go back and be a little child. And I tell you folks, we've got a lot of people who are so scared of their freedom that they want to be infantilized. They want to be children. He tells them a little later in Galatians, he said, you know, watch out. Don't use your freedom as an occasion for the flesh. I'll also say to you that we've got a lot of adolescents in the church. <laughs> they haven't quite grown up. They don't know how to use their freedom yet. They act out. But you know, the way to help an adolescent is not to take them back to childhood. It's to take them through adolescence to adulthood. And a lot of us in the church are so scared of our freedom, so, so scared of what God brings to us, that we want to keep people children. And Paul says, no, I want you to go through adolescence to adulthood. I want you to experience freedom. The old laws, Paul says, are gone. It's heretical to go back. These people in Galatia, they can eat anything that they want at any time they want with anyone they want. There is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer slave nor free. There is no longer male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And when Paul says in Christ Jesus, I want you to think about Christ as Messiah. And think of Messiah as one who comes into his kingdom. So in the kingdom of Messiah, in the kingdom of God, in that advanced guard of the kingdom that we call the church, there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free. 
male and female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Anyone is in Christ, Paul told the Corinthians. There is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. Paul insisted the Spirit was given to everyone. The spiritual gifts were given to all people. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jew or Greek, slaves or free, and were all made to drink of one Spirit. It is clear that Paul understood this gift of the kingdom, the spirit, to be a gift that's given to all, to both men and women. It's clear, as you well know, from 1 Corinthians 11, that women prayed and prophesied in the Pauline church. And Paul would say that, that prophecy is perhaps the most important gift of all. Pursue love and strive for spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And I think in this, Paul is simply learning from Jesus. And that Paul would say, just as Jesus would say, all God's people are priests, all God's people have the Spirit, and all God's people are holy. Well, so what? All this suggests to me that any restriction on any of God's people, male or female, is contrary to the kingdom ideal and a violation of the express intent of Jesus. When we limit women in any way, we're going against Jesus. We're going against our Savior. We're going against His kingdom work. Making such distinctions is no longer valid in the new creation. And women should not be restricted in any way in their service of God. It's contrary to the witness of Jesus, of Paul, and of the entire New Testament. And in my opinion, it's simply wrong. Now we all know the hard passages our passages which have been beaten to death. <laughs> and I don't want to beat them to death anymore this morning except to say that these passages have to be read in light of the intentions of Jesus and the presence of the kingdom of God in the church. They cannot be understood to contradict the clear expectations of Jesus that these barriers would be removed and that all God's people are going to have the spirit be holy and be priests. Now, whatever particular and local restrictions Paul may have implied in some of his writings, his work everywhere assumes that women have gifts, possess a spirit, and exercise these gifts freely along their male, alongside their male colleagues in the community, just as Linda showed us in the first day of the conference. The church stands before the world. Representing the kingdom of God. Anticipating the kingdom of God. When people look at our communities, when they look at the way we relate to one another, when they look at the way we care for the world, when they look at the, world we, the way we preach and pray and worship, they are supposed to experience a sacrament of the kingdom. They are supposed to have that taste on their tongue of what the kingdom is going to be like. They are supposed to enter in our communities and say, if this is what the community of the kingdom is like, I want this. In the kingdom, Jesus declared that holiness was not about separation. It was about access. In the kingdom, Jesus declared that the least and the lost and the losers are invited to the party. In the kingdom, Jesus said that the old restrictions about persons, places, times, and objects are removed. In this kingdom, the peaceable kingdom of Israel, of Isaiah, what do we say, friends? All God's people are priests. All God's people have the Spirit, and all God's people are holy. Why, Paul wondered, and I wonder, would we want to go back to that old pattern of restriction and barrier and slavery and fear? Why would we want to go back to being children again? When we can be grown-up adult men and women serving as priests in the kingdom of God. The evangelical church has struggled with the question of women in ministry long enough. I'm not naive enough to think that it won't continue to struggle with this question, but it's struggled with it long enough anyway. It's time to put questions and doubts behind us and follow Jesus. A novel thought. <laughs> the time has passed for any evangelical church to refuse to consider a woman pastor. 
The time has passed for women to remain on the margins of leadership in our institutional life. It's time for all the gifts and graces that God has given to his people to be used. Why? Because the mission that we have been given is so massive, so huge, that it's sinful to marginalize anyone. Amen. We've got too much work to do to tell half of the people in the world that they've got to stay away from the party. Because all God's people are priests that they love again. Let's pray. Oh God, you call us to be a representation of the kingdom. And we have failed in that task. We have implied that only some of God's people are priests. Only a few of them have enough spirit that it matters. And we're not sure how many are holy at all. We lack the audacity of Paul and Jesus. We are timid. We are cautious, we are afraid, we are sinners. But by the grace, the risk-taking grace of your power and love, we ask that you would break down the barriers that we so rapidly have tried to put back up again, that you would tear the curtains that we have sewn back together, and that you would remind us again of the Isaiah kingdom that you came to. Oh God, we draw now to this table that anticipates that great feast for all people. We come to this table because you have invited us. You have invited us not because we're so holy and good, but quite the contrary, because we are such broken sinners and we need your forgiveness and grace and your love. We need what this table represents the cross, the grace of God's forgiveness, and the power of new life. As we come to this table, prepare us not only to receive your love and power, but to receive the love and power of brothers and sisters, holy, priests, godly, good people called by you to represent your Oh God, give us the strength to do so in the power of your spirit through Christ our Lord. Amen.